Welcome to Talking In Stations, a podcast about EVE Online. I am Matterall, and uh, I'm here with the TIS crew and a guest. Uh, I'll introduce the panelists first. This is Sutonia. Hi, once again. Uh, we have Rain with us. Hello, everyone. Off camera is Kenneth Feld. Hey, good morning. I'm not muted, am I? No, you're good. I can totally hear you. And uh, one of our guests today is uh, General Stargazer. How are you doing, General? Pretty fantastic. How about you? Really good. Uh, later, we'll have Casper come on, and uh, he is a team captain for Alliance and an Alliance tournament team. And we'll talk about the Alliance tournament a little later in the show. We have a few things that we want to take care of before that, including this spectacular new money-making feature, the uh, ESS, the Encounter Surveillance System. And these are the grand heists that we'll be looking at uh, in addition to uh, other bits of news, uh, before we get to the big news of the week, which was the Alliance Tournament reveal that it is back, the Alliance Tournament is back, and what the prize, the prize structure is, what the uh, actual arena looks like, um, as far as where it is located, all this stuff is important to people who are tournament players. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right. Thank you guys for being patient. Again, uh, let's go into... First topic, which is, and this is important to a small group of people, the Linux client and how it is broken. And some people who are on Linux can't play EVE anymore. And just a little background here before we start. When I came to EVE Online, one of the selling points for me was this game is so advanced and so mature that it has a Linux client. And I was happy to see a Mac client, but it had a Mac client and a Linux client in addition to the Windows client. And I just thought, wow, these guys are sophisticated. Uh, and then uh, later I found out that it was, you know, it was Wine, basically, that, uh, let's see, Wine is not, what, what's Wine stand for? Wine is not Windows emulation. in a something environment, I think. I, th I thought it was uh, recursive. Wine is not emulation. I think that's that's what I heard it was. But okay, anyway. So the point was that it was uh, a, a wine client and so was Linux. And since they're both um, Unix based, that kind of worked out. But anyway, something happened and Linux doesn't work anymore. Even though Mac will have its own client, Linux, I think, is at end of life uh, for Eve. Is that true? Um, it's been end of life since 2009 when they ended support. It's just been hanging on the coattails of the Mac client because, as you said, they used Wine. There for a while, they used a custom CIDR build for the Mac client um, so that they could rearrange some keystrokes so that our Apple key emulated the control key. And right now, if you play on a Mac, you'll know that if you hit the Alt or our Apple key and try and do something, it doesn't work. So we have to use the control key like Windows, which is really messed with my... Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, but that being said, it still all worked on Wine. The Mac had a native launcher for many years now. And of course, Windows has a native launcher. And Linux was using, I believe, the Windows launcher in Wine, and it was working no problem. Or maybe they were using a Linux launcher. But either way, they changed the launcher. And they did not publish a Linux version of the new launcher. The way it handles the tokens is different. Now, I have no idea why they changed to handle tokens, but I would imagine there's a lot of privacy laws in the European Union and stuff that are probably driving it. But again, I, that's just pure speculation. I have no idea. And then all of a sudden it, it stopped working. So a lot of the guys are either rolling back to older launchers or uh, I think a few people have made custom launchers and that's pretty much where they are right now. And, you know, there is no official support for it. So they're going to get what they get. Yeah. Well, I think one of the uh, troubling, there's two things I think about this. One is that, of course, is my perception of EVE Online is taking another hit, which is that it's not so advanced it has a Linux client. But more importantly, there are some third-party developers that might be Kind of hardcore Linux users. I was wondering if, if there's any fear of, of losing those kinds of extra valuable guys. 
I don't think so because, uh, like Kenneth uh, mentioned, there are workarounds available, and most people who use Linux tend to be, you know, a lot more tech savvy than other, you know, like Windows or Mac users, generally speaking. Right. So I think they'll, they'll think they'll figure it out and they'll find a workaround for it. Yeah, well, that's what I heard. Like, if anybody can get past this, it's the Linux guys, uh, just because they're living in a more hostile environment, right? With Linux itself, you have to build a lot of your own stuff. Uh, so, and I've also heard actually unofficially that there are some Linux guys that are working on getting past this uh, sort of thing, but as Kenneth was saying, not officially supported. So I wonder if, um, the Eve anywhere client would end up working on a, a Linux, um, machine with uh, sure. just a standard web browser as an alternative. Yeah, I'm on an M1 Mac and it's and that's the new chip which doesn't have a lot of software built directly for it and i think uh when i tried to use the the macintosh client it doesn't work on my machine but uh and that could just be me but what does work is the uh, eve anywhere uh browser game and so that's definitely something that i'm sure could work uh, for them is that a good experience i mean i've tried it but i don't have a lot of bandwidth where i am so it's kind of laggy, but yeah. I wrote that off to being out in the middle of nowhere. That's it. Yeah, it's very good. It's very responsive. I, I'm surprised. I'm surprised and not surprised because I do have like um, PS Now, I think it is. And um, what's the other one? GeForce Now. So I've been, I've been trying to play with this technology to find out if it's good. The problem is you can't get the sharpest graphics. You'll get like the second sharpest graphics. And in some games that makes a difference. Uh, you know, uh, Eve looks really good though. It looks like the sharpest graphics. Uh, Stargazer, you're nodding your head. Have you had experience with it? No, I mean, I was just literally agreeing the, the fact that Eve is very visual. It's a very visual game. Um, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time uh, taking photographs and recording video in, in the game in, in as high detail as possible. So I just, you know, agreeing completely with what you're saying. Yeah, the thing is, it's it's bandwidth. So if you don't have a strong computer, and you may not for whatever reason, um, that Eve Anywhere is a really nice alternative because you get full graphics at full speed, regardless of the, your computer. If you can run a browser, you can you can basically run full graphics, full speed. The problem is you need that bandwidth. That's, so it shifts all that weight off your computer to your connection. So if you don't have a good connection because you're in a rural part of the country or for whatever reason, then uh, it's a bad trade-off. Oh, uh, excuse me. AFK, mm -hmm. real quick. Chickens just got out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. He's got to show the chickens now. I want yeah, to see now chickens. we have to see chickens. Uh, well, we have Rich Richmond uh, on staff who has llamas. And uh, now we, yeah, so we have all kinds of exotic animals. Wait, I thought they were alpacas. Oh, no, alpacas. You're right. I think they're alpacas. They're so friendly. I Googled it once because my boss wants to start an alpaca farm and you can buy them cheap and they're super fluffy. Highly recommend Eve players all invest in animals for when the internet shuts yeah. down. And uh, Kaskora, who's our webmaster, she has a, a sheep farm. So like we, <laughs> we definitely have like a whole talking and stations farm. Uh, yeah, what's funny was when Rich said, I have some alpacas, I was like, that's cute. He's showing around alpha players. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? They, somebody was, so when, alpha, when alpha players first came around, somebody uh, was uh, mistyping al uh, alphas and they typed alpacas. And so that alpha. Sounds, that sounds like even better though. Like it perfectly yeah. fits a new player, like small and cute and like usually really friendly and fluffy. Yeah, so the name stuck for a while. New players were known as alpacas. Uh, all right. So uh, enough about the Linux. Good luck, guys. We're, we're cheering for you. I am especially. Uh, let's talk about the economy, which... Uh, oh, shoot. We're going to need uh, the chicken chaser for that one. Hmm. Maybe you can talk about reserve banks for a bit. Because, yeah, let's do uh, that. I can talk about that. Yeah, ESS, uh, Encounter Surveillance System has two layers of banks and one of them is something that you can access at any time of the day uh, the second one though is locked until something happens so what's happening 
Yeah, so CCP are going to be uh, releasing the keys to the banks pretty soon. I think in the dev blog it says it, you can expect them by the end of July. So they'll probably come on the last week of July, I think. So I think like July 24th, July 25th, somewhere around that that perspective, that, that, er, that time frame. Uh, the, the new keys are going to drop from sites exclusive to LOSEC, which is kind of interesting. Uh, uh, the sites themselves are going to be, uh, this is one of the things that the CSM was pretty unhappy about, and we've had many words about it. Uh, but the the, uh, the keys themselves are going to come from instance PVE low-sec sites that are going to be very challenging and require cooperative gameplay. I think there's uh, there's some leaks yeah. on Hobo Leaks, so the CSM actually haven't seen the sites themselves, although we've seen uh, CCP uh, talk about it some. So... Uh, it it has um sorry to interrupt you here but it has the like a you have to work with a partner because it has like a double coding system it's like mission impossible kind of stuff right yeah yeah you need uh, you need two ships out of the three that you can bring into the site and you'll probably want to bring three in especially because it gives you safety right because if you have the third person in then no one can come into the site behind you and you you need two data data uh, people to hack something i think presumably around the same time so you're gonna need. So it's gonna be harder to multi-box probably. So you're probably gonna want at least uh, at least two people, one person to come with you. Yeah, I love what you said. Let me just point that out. You want to fill that third spot so a, so a stranger doesn't sneak in to you and your friends. Uh, yeah, it will also make the site easier too because uh, uh, it's gonna be pretty challenging. Uh, there's also other things uh, that you can see on Hoverlix too. Like there's mines. So presumably you, you might have to manually pilot to avoid. Uh, getting blown up. Assuming they're not like cloaked and you have to know this like invisible path to, to find to get to your bank vault. Yeah, I, I don't know how it's going to play out. I assume it'll probably be similar to the sleeper, you know, I don't know if any of you on the sleeper data, sleeper side cache things, where there's those like things that can explode if you go too close to them. It's, I imagine it's probably Ghost something sites. like that. Yeah. Yes. Is it ghost sites? Yeah, ghost sites. Yeah, on a sleeper, limited sleeper cache, standard sleeper cache, superior sleeper cache, those ones, they have those little oh, uh, those things that explodes. Oh, yeah. okay. I was thinking ghost sites where like you're hacking, but you're panic hacking because if you screw up, it explodes. And if you take too long, the rats show up. Is that gone, the ghost sites, by the way? No, they're still around. It seems to be actually buffed them recently by adding in uh, new components that you can only get from them that are necessary oh. for capital production. This is this is weird, but that was the last time I was excited about new content was ghost sites. Gave rise to uh, angry Concord guy. <laughs> That's true, and he became president of CCP. So exactly. <laughs> yeah, but once you uh, get one of these keys, the, the keys are actually interesting. They're, they're divided into four quadrants. So there's a, a northeast quadrant key, there's a northwest quadrant key, there's a southeast quadrant key, and a, a south uh, east quadrant key. So, uh, so there's four different types of keys, and there's two different time frames too. So there's a a five minute key, uh, it unlocks the bank for 15 minutes. The five minutes just means that's how long you have to be there before it hits the peak payout. And there's also the 15 minute key, which you have to be on grid for 45 minutes. And the current numbers on Singularity and the numbers that we were told on the CSM are the same right now. It's subject to change though before it goes live on release. But right now it's a flat payment of uh, 1.1 billion if you use the five minute key or of 3.4 billion if you use the 15 minute key uh, and that's uh, if you stay on grid for the full duration so 15 and 45 minutes perspe uh, respectively it's a bit confusing that yeah that the uh, the 15 minute key well, opens up for 45 you, minutes you can think of it if you're being a bank robber that you're coming in there the vaults open and you have to shovel money into your bag and one bag is so small it takes five minutes and one bag is so big it takes 45 minutes but you get a lot more money so that's how i would think of it um in this okay so there was some confusion earlier because people went to the test center and basically said hey this isn't worth it this i'm only getting like a, you know. yeah then the numbers were uh tuned down a lot lower than they were because ccp were doing testing on it or something so yeah. that way they didn't want to drain like all of, all of the banks straight away because Otherwise, there would be nothing left for people to test. But now, now the numbers are at the right values, or at least the values that they're proposing. They may still change, of course. It's on the test server. But you're looking at 1.1 billion for the 15-minute full duration thing, 3.4 billion for the 45-minute one. So that's a lot of risk, potentially, if you can get your hands on it. Yeah. 
Actually, I was talking. They said here, uh, Shadon, Shadonar said, uh, Bjorn B is going to run around with 20 guys and rob them all. I was just talking to him, actually, and he's he hasn't actually looked this yet. Not that he won't in time, but he hasn't actually turned. He's having so much fun in Treglavian space. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Yeah, but, he's, uh, he did a Nida conflict last night, actually, I believe. Uh, did, did you guys talk about the keys putting I, out the region-wide message? Did you catch all the chickens? Yeah. We're yeah. great. We're uh, yeah. That's gonna be that's gonna be. You better bring some sizable stuff if you're trying to steal something. You know, if you're using the forty-five minute key, uh, yeah, you can. You might get some resistance. Yeah, because as soon as you use a key, uh, it actually uh, it sends out a, a ping, a little notification, the same one you get for when someone opens up the main bank in the system that you're in. But it goes to the entire region. So every like, if you open up a. Uh, a reserve bank in Delve, every single person in Delve is going to know about it. And it also appears on the agency too. Uh, and you can see that from anywhere. So anyone who's paying attention, there might be someone who's just looking at reserve banks open in Ferro, and they could maybe see, oh, this, this region's close to us, we can go there. So it's definitely going to be uh, pretty dangerous, right? And for the long keys, you're going to have to hold it for like 20 minutes or so before the, the ISK really starts rolling in. Elsewise, it's just peanuts. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting though, right? Because most people don't care to defend the banks unless you know they're the ones who earned the ISK or their group was the one that earned the ISK. So what you may end up having is like multiple. I won't say like large fleets, but smaller fleets of like groups going around trying to ninja this loot, and they'll say, "Oh, there's a group over here already. So let's wait till they start going, and then we can move into this bank, which may have more." So then that way, you know, ideally the defenders will be off distracted trying to attack the first group where they got the first notification, and then they can try to steal something else. So even though I know it's like the goal is to try and encourage PvP, but I feel like a lot of these like elite small gang groups are just going to like somehow feed off each other and use it to try and like multi-attack an area. So oh, I know. I, <laughs> hmm? I mean, if I was the other small grand group, I would just go and kill the other small grand group and take their bank that they just unlocked for me. Yeah, I mean, you once, could do that or you could do it yourself. Bank, it's open. Anyone can, yeah. attach, anyone can attach to it. So like if I go open a bank and I have a group and there's another small group four jumps away that opens a bank, and then we leave one person here and go kill that other group, we can attach to their bank as well and, and then collect both banks. Is it, yeah. so is it it's a so flat, it, is the flat it, rate only like proportional? So if it's 10 million ISK, does it go 10 million each person? Or if there's four people, it's 2.5 million each? It might be equally between everyone in the fleet. Well, everyone oh, sorry, anyone on the bank. Rates. Yeah, so it's an AOE payout mechanic. So you could even have like you could have a fleet that's already attached to it, and another fleet that comes in to fight that fleet, and while they're fighting, all of them are getting paid. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I like that. Or or you could have a fleet of twenty people and all of them in there, and only one person attached to the bank collecting all of the ISK and the other group fighting either on the gate or whatever else to try and keep people out. You know, it's it, it's more you collect the ISK, but then it's more of a, you know, agreed upon payout amongst the fleet mates at the end, that type of thing as well. No, that makes sense. I don't know. I figured, I figured there'd be some metagaming too, right? Because a lot of small gang groups kind of have this mutual respect. And if you would rather fight a blob of like 50 idiots or like a, or like a group of five, like elite PV peers, I would definitely rather fight the blob of idiots just to farm kills and steal their stuff. But yeah, while you're fighting, if you fight on the on the ESS and you're within what I think it's like 5K or 10K, whatever it is, if you're within range to attach to the bank, while you guys are duking it out, both fleets can be attached to the bank and both fleets collecting payments as people are dying. Nice. And um. So the natural comp if sorry the natural competition there is there's only there's a cap of 1.1 billion let's say so. You want to kill other people that are hanging out with you. Right. Hanging, that's the yeah. small key. That's the short key. Or okay. Yeah, the, the big key is 3.4 billion right now. Oh. So yeah, the short key, you have to stay on grid for 15 minutes to get that full one point well, one point one billion, and the, the long key is forty-five minutes to get the full three point four billion. Right. Uh, it does have the peak payout, that's the name of the key. So there's a five minute key. The peak payout starts at five minutes. So what you could do is you could uh you could sit in, sit in there for 10 minutes and you've got the peak pal, then you could leave maybe. 
if you get spooked or something, but but I, you could negotiate. Say people come in, and you're both on the bank. You're not on the same team. You could say, "Look, man, take half of it. <laughs> we just want half." You can negotiate <laughs> that, right? Like, well, it depends uh, no. on what you paid for the key, too. Oh, all right, uh, Rain. I cut you off. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just. I forgot. I, I don't even know what I was going to say. Like, because I was curious as so like, if you unlock the vault. Do you, the person who unlocks it, do they have to stay in the vault for it to stay unlocked? No, or if they yeah. die, does the key drop? Oh, so once it's unlocked, it's unlocked for anyone. So if you disconnect, someone else could be like, oh, look at this empty vault just draining money, and they could sit in it or whatever? Bingo. Yeah, so some, someone wow. could go in, kill the person who opened up the bank, then they can claim it for themselves. Or... It's like but killing it... your safe cracker on the, in, it, while you're uh, doing your bank heist, <laughs> and you get away with a bigger <laughs> share, right? Exactly. I've seen that movie. And you can only use one key at a time. So it's if you have like three long keys, you can't run them all simultaneously and get the extra ISK out. You have to one, run one key for 45 minutes, then another key for 45 minutes, then another key for 45 minutes to get the full 10 billion ISK. Yeah, and this pays out in tags. It doesn't pay out in direct ISK, so you, you will need to be able to take them to an NPC station. I kind of wish CSMP would fix the thing where you can uh, cargo deposit and other people's structures in NORSEC, but... I think they'll get around to doing that, unfortunately. Even if they fix that, the best method then is you just take a thera wormhole or, or a filament to Poshvin and then jump back out and like almost relative safety, right? Yeah, you can do that too. They they might they might fix that soon. Who knows? Uh, but they uh, but the point is that you get something in your cargo and you have to deliver that cargo someplace to cash in. It's like poker chips, you know. Yeah, you, yeah. you sold them to NPC stations in high sec and low sec, I believe. They're, they're mm -hmm. the ones like Pend Insurance, like the, the banking NPC corporations. Okay, so just as a review, and you guys correct me, but um, there are keys that are going to be given in low sec to people that can do this Mission Impossible style code hacking, which is... A different kind of gameplay than PvP. If you get those keys, it's one of four regions on the map. So you can go to anywhere. The keys, let's say, are in the north. Uh, you can take those northern keys, plug them into any system in the north, and try to access that great big bank for as long as you can before you're interrupted or taken out or whatever. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to add one thing too. Um, the, the site's currently not up on Sissy. At least I don't think they are. Um, when they come up, I implore everyone to please go on Sissy, try and run them, and look at the mechanics. And if uh, you are not satisfied, um, feel free to contact your local CSM rep and uh, you know make Reddit scream and Twitter and everything else. Does Reddit work yeah, anymore? Yeah, the, uh, the, the like, uh, instant site thing is something that the CSM was really unhappy about, like I already mentioned. So uh, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, the the know, instant what? Sorry, the instant what? The, the site's are instant, right? We said there was a free person limit. Uh, right. So if three people are in it, then no one can follow them inside. I think CSPR are changing, like making it so you're a little more likely to get caught when you're coming out. But uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's something that there's been many words about. I our, find... our, our input was uh, required, but not necessarily desired, I guess is a good way to put that. They told us about it, and they said, what do you think? And we told them, and they're like, oh, no, it's fine. And thank you. Have a nice day. I was going to say, there's uh, my interesting contribution to this is the, the drifter wormholes, right, were introduced way, way, way back. And the mechanic, there's um, five different drifter wormholes. And the mechanic originally when the drifter wormholes were launched was you had two fleets, you had to have a fleet up each side, and you had this exact same uh, unlocking mechanic. So you had, say, Team A on the left, Team B on the right. Team B would have um, to unlock or decrypt uh, the gate for Team A's side. So you go through, you do your, your typical antivirus hacking thing, and then you would hold on the core until you hear that Team A was ready to do exactly the same thing. So you basically That's break right. through the core at the same time. The gate is unlocked for a minute. I think by the looks of Hobo Leaks, you get seconds rather than like a minute this time. So you unlock each other's gate, and then you go through. And what actually happened on the Drifter ones is, again, this actually 
sounds interesting considering the regions, the way that this is distributed, because when you got through to that final room, when you killed uh, Hikanta Taranos, the, the mob that appears in there, it gives you a key for another Drifter wormhole. So you go through and it, it gave you the sequence of, you know, you get a key from one for wormhole two. So you go through that whole entire sequence. So it looks like the mechanic that was used for the Drifter wormholes is ending up being reused here. But the the interesting thing about the uh, the unlocking as well is when um, when Team A would unlock the gate for Team B, you used to get a ping out in local, just to say, oh yeah, this this gate has been unlocked. So I guess it's it's an indication that at least someone in the system is about to potentially unlock a uh, a, a vault essentially. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, interesting cooperative gameplay, which I think CCP is always experimenting with, trying to get people to play together. Uh, as opposed to a guy yeah. adults. Yeah, I like that. It's way more fun having stuff that you can do with your friends where you're not like limiting each other. Like I always think of some of the event sites, right? Like the live events. If you and your friend are doing them together, really only one person gets credit. So it kind of messes with them. So something where CCP is actively encouraging that and but making it complex enough where, you know, it's not just me with my three alts and ha 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 look at me multi-box or whatever is way better, I think, for the game. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, there are, there are mines as well on Hoverlix too, right? So there's like manually oh, yeah. manual piloting involved, which sounds pretty funny because like some guy is gonna like crash into a mine and completely fuck his whole fleet. It's just always gonna be funny. I love that idea. Um, okay, but the 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 grand scheme of things is again go to low sec, find these keys, then you have the opportunity to go to null sec where these banks are. They only exist in null sec with sovereignty. Um, right or the NPC? As yeah, well? they're, they're not in any of the NPC uh, regions. I think in the key descriptions they do mention the NPC regions, but there, there are no uh, encounters of alien systems there. Right, because these all these vaults and stuff depend on sovereignty. That's kind of what they're they're about. And every every ESS is searchable on in the agency. You can search right. by reserve bank value by region by all kinds of uh, what's closest to you i think number of jumps from you so it is incredibly easy to see where you know the big cash grabs are going to be and then maybe some areas that you can get the full amount of your key and yet you may encounter you know a little less resistant should we say uh, and all that information is available and searchable in the agency yeah, you can even search for a reserve bank unlocked as a as a search option. No so you way, can see really? every yeah, every bank yeah. that's unlocked in the entire game at any point. Isn't that just like a, a beacon of like head in that direction? Yep. Okay, so here's my big question, because these are we're talking about a huge amount of money that's put in these banks. And there are people who are it's only sovereign space, so people are sov holders that are going to want to defend these banks because it basically represents a portion of their ratting income that they had to, you know, put into the bank. Who's going to have this money? Is, it, is, is NullSec just going to sit on their own banks and be the ones to kind of control the grid and survive and, and take all the money? Probably. I mean, I assume for uh, like bigger alliances, what they'll do is they'll have an FC who puts a character inside the SS and then they'll have like a fleet on the outside and then the ace gets like split between, you know, like the Alliance and the FC or something. Okay, so here's my, if that's the case, Imperium's, Imperium's uh, in, in, a, in a disadvantaged position here, right? They're down well, to one I mean, constellation. <laughs> I mean, they're also in an advantageous position in that they can steal every bank in the game except for seven, right? But they have to control grids to do that. Can they do that? Do you think they'll be able to do that or is this probably yeah. i mean it depends it depends on where they're stealing from it like are, are they going to be able to steal it still from t5c i don't think so are they going to be able to take a have like 20 goons who are bored they like take a filament out in 20 caracals and open a bank in like a mm. dead region like wicked creek yeah sure they probably can right right you've got to remember right like one of the big things about the reserve banks too is a lot of the juicy reserve banks uh, are in owasa and like uh, around right. the drone regions where fraternity used to be but they're not uh, they're not there there anymore right like they still have uh, uh they, st they can still have a presence there but they're not a that most of their fleet is in veil of the silent right so there's a lot of because and because of sort of the musical chairs that sort of happened because of the war there's a lot of uh, reserve banks in the south like for example where impasse is where uh, brave used to be mm -hmm. and brave were, were farming there that 
that don't have like big reserve banks from Brave, but now Brave aren't there. Now Red Alliance are there. So, yeah. What do you think about that, Kenneth? Do you have an opinion since you're kind of in the war? Well, hmm. yeah, but you also look where those keys come from. Those keys will come from all the drone regions. Keys should come from around Iridia or around that region, right? Well, who controls that region now? Most of the people that own the space up in the drone regions. So, you know, there can be some frenemy stuff going on there where, you know, I'm sure Horde with their masses, they're going to be out there farming whatever they can, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So if they end up with their own keys, that's just more isk in their pocket to begin with, uh, just because of the way that the, the keys are going to be distributed. So the flip side to that is the keys for down south where you're talking about are going to come from up north somewhere, I think. And so who gets those? Who lives in that area now that can get those keys? Can they do anything about them? You know, and the keys will be able to be sold um, they're an item in game. So I don't know if they'll be on the market, but definitely contracts for sure. So you put up a right. 45 minute key for one, one and a half billion that the guys who got it split their share of that. And if the Alliance who owns that space gets it, then they can pretty much hold the grid and, you know, they get the extra 2 billion out of the reserve bank that way. That's right. You can't sell these on the market, but you can. No, not on, not on the test server yet. Um, it's, that CSP might allow you to sell them on the market, we don't know, but they will definitely be on contracts if they're not on the market. Yeah, so you can't trade them among players. These aren't. Yeah. yeah. And the sort of intention is as well, right? There's, there might be like deals between alliances. Like, yeah. Uh, you can have an alliance in the north say, hey, look, if we get a, a, a key to the south, uh, we'll give it to you if you trade it one to one for a key to the north and, and things like that, right? Yeah, that's where I was going. Like, they're going to make deals with yeah. one another. But the flip side to that is who's up north right now? Fraternity is in the northern area, low sec and stuff. If they get the keys and, you know, a bunch of their blue friends are down in Delve right now, you know, kicking it back on the someone's front lawn, uh, you know, we could we could heist at least the good points of Delve. If nothing else, you know, poke the stick at them and see if uh, if they form to come after us going after all of their reserve banks all over Delve. Well, it's going to be interesting. Uh, again, this is a, a new mechanic based on old mechanics, it looks like, even the, the Drifter stuff that you were mentioning earlier, Stargazer. Uh, a lot of money at stake. Do we know how much money in the is out there? Uh, tw 20 trillion they mentioned in the uh, dev blog. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was public yet. I was going to tell you, well, about half a year, it was about eight, and, you know, do the math. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's over 20 trillion. That's I wonder how quickly that's going to end up getting drained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, crap. I'm not sure. just for that, right? Because if, if the max is 3.4 bill for one 45-minute key, that's a lot of keys people got to farm. Right, but that doesn't, that's, um, huh, that's been built up for quite a while. So you don't want to flood with keys and then have to pull them back, right? So you'd want to keep the keys at a, at a steady, even pace. And they can adjust the keys with how much they know how much goes into reserve banks every day. Say ten billion goes in every day. Just just pick the number. So you'd want roughly, you know, two big keys and and three little keys going out a day type thing. So you you, you want to you want to get that twenty trillion down to a manageable number. But then again, there's probably a ton of places where there's five hundred to eight hundred million in a reserve bank that a key would be wasted on. So all that, anything below 1.1 billion or whatever a small key is, is essentially wasted. So you've got to discount all that. That's probably a trillion, maybe 2 trillion straight off the top that can't really be accessed because it's below the threshold for a key. So you've got to kind of look at it that way as well. It would just be interesting just to look at the overall distribution of that that wealth. Essentially, you know, if if that twenty trillion is actually held in a in a quarter of all the actual banks, and oh, every, yeah. all, all the other ones, you know, are are lesser values. Like, I wonder how quickly the the lesser value ones will end up getting drained. I imagine the uh, the north uh, the north uh, east quadrant keys are probably going to have the biggest uh, amount of risk in them total. The interesting thing is that. Uh, 
like the Kavala Expanse where Horda and then Uasa where Fraternus used to live, then they all, all are all on the same key. So it's going to be a lot of demand for those keys, I think. Yeah. Okay. So one last thing: is this a temporary releasing of the keys, and will they turn off no. that spigot? Okay, so this will be rolling. Uh, as far as I can tell, this is like evergreen content. Like mm. the, they're not going to change the sides once they're re released. Uh, these yeah. sides will always be in the game, and you'll always just be able to get the keys from the from the sites. They they will control how much the sites. They don't. They, I don't think they ever want to end up where there's you know a thousand keys for sale, but no place to use them. Right. So they will control the spawn rate of the sites because the key is a guaranteed drop. So the, the sites will be controlled in that manner. But like you said, it is evergreen. The plan is to, you know, as more people rat, reserve banks fill up, you know, more keys come in. And once they get to an equilibrium point, you know, so I, I don't know, five, eight trillion, whatever it is, I would imagine they're going to probably try and, and tune it to keep it just about there. I can just imagine like, too many keys going out into the environment. So they decide to put more mines in the final room. The less people actually make their way through. Yeah, it takes for people to complete the one one event site because they're all dying to mines. Exactly. <laughs> so Ixacool in the audience asks, uh, shouldn't should they make these not sellable? What's the? Oh, I argument? think it would be it would make sense if they if they kept them off the market and let you contract them because it's a lot harder to see. You can't see the keys, the contract prices as easily. You can't look at like price history. And it also means that generally, because contract slots are a lot more limited, right? Like generally you need, it'll be a lot more like personal sort of deals rather than things that you just put up on the market. I and also since, since these come from Concord, right? They're like SEC keys, technically, it doesn't really make sense that they'd let you just put them up on the market. I was going to say, aren't the, the tags for uh, security status the same way? Uh, you can buy tags oh, you, for You can buy those the on the market. They're on the market, okay. Yeah, I think Ig Igsakul's um, idea was they should be bond on pickup, but kind of thing, bind on pickup. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't even know that Eve has that. I think that's a Warcraft thing, isn't it? Or no, something? skins. Skins are like that, or at least the the prizes you but, get. Well, I, I guess you could have it go into your redeeming queue or something, and you can only activate the bank from the redeeming queue. But that would be really weird. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's an in-game physical item, so it'll always be contractible. Rain. The other thing I was thinking, um, so you guys were talking a bit about how, so there's 20 trill already reserved or in the reserve banks, but that's been over months and months of people, you know, building that up. So then if CCP is releasing these keys, do you think they potentially down the line, I know you're a CSM, so you probably can't speculate on this, but down the line, wouldn't that mean CCP would have to do something to encourage more ratting or more more ways to generate that reserve bank growth because otherwise oh. what you're going to do is have it go up and then go down and it might reach a point where if nobody's well, ratting can if uh can if already like touched on that a little bit with the equilibrium thing right like that ideally i think they, they put out enough keys that it, it drops down so we, we go down from say 20 trillion to you know 8 to 10 trillion and then they re reduce the spawn rate for the sites or something so then it just it's, yeah, during our last meeting, too, I also, um, you know, we, we were just kind of talking about it, and I suggested that if they were running into problems with people filling the reserve banks fast enough, that as you use a key, it could increase your multiplier slightly to kind of offset it to make that system more uh, enticing for people to rat there. Um, I don't think that's anything that will happen immediately. Um, but that is an option that they do have if they choose to use it um, to help increase the amount of reserve banks available. I, just thought, I was just I was just thinking long term because you don't want to end up in this place where the keys are worthless because there's not enough in the reserve banks or something along those lines. Yeah, I think they would shut down the sites before they got there personally. Yeah, I mean the the, the thing is like hopefully that the uh, using a reserve bank key will increase the DVS modifier because people will die and fight for them, right? So hopefully that ends up being a thing. All right. Well, ESS, um, what is it? Encounter surveillance system. The the big banks are opening up, and this was news to me that these things will be ongoing. This will be evergreen content. So you have a a small bank, the daily bank that you can grab. Or these bigger banks uh, where you need keys from low sec uh, in order to open them up. 
and then uh, all the things that follow with that. So interesting. And I did want to I did want to reemphasize. It's going to be interesting to see in a in a in an era where war is expensive again, how this twenty trillion is going to be distributed among people. Okay. So let's move on to. I wanted to save you for this. Uh, the banks, uh, not the banks, the uh, economy. Uh, Suetonia, you were looking at Plex, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Kenneth is probably a lot more qualified to talk about this than me, but uh, I was looking at Plex prices recently. I think I posted something in the in the Sunday show planning thing. There's a uh, order item quantity of Plex. I don't know if you can bring that up on the screen, that or all. Yeah, I'm, I'm not your Plex guy. I just freaking blew 550,000 Plex and I am still crying over that. So I haven't, uh, I haven't gotten to the point of buying more yet. Oh my God. Yeah, I, I plexed uh, what, 10, 11 accounts, whatever it was for the year. So yeah, 10 accounts for the year using Plex. So uh, yeah, I'm poor. Send disk. Oh yeah, so Matterall has, a, has the graph on the, on the stream right now. So the, the line in red that you see, that's uh, unfulfilled buy orders. That's buy orders that are on the market that aren't being filled. Then the the uh, sell the green line is the uh, sell orders that go unfulfilled, and then the blue line is the the amount that's actually traded. And if you if you take a look, uh, the red line now has uh, actually exceeded the amount that's actually being traded, and it's been uh, and whenever the red line is above the green line, essentially that means it's a it's a seller's market. Well, when the green line is above the red line, it means it's a, a buyer's market, obviously. So there's some pretty interesting data points on there. Uh, I think Matter was talking about in April, early April. Whatever you can see it on this graph, you might need to look at the in-game text for that. But there was a point, I think it shows up kind of on that graph too. I think on, on about the 3rd of April, uh, yeah, there was like a, a big rally for Plex. Like, I think Plex hit its like lowest point that it had ever had. Uh, in, 20, in 2021 at that point, and then it rallied up uh, from that point on. And that was actually when the industry changes uh, took place. So it's kind of weird that Plex price went up because my assumption would be a bunch of people would sell their own Plex so or, or buy a Plex with real money and sell it so they would have capital to be able to buy the new blueprints or to buy uh, minerals so that they could put builds into a production before the, the industry changes hit. So. It's kind of interesting that Plex price went up, but there also might be people uh, plexing the industry alts that they had so that they could like activate them and get jobs in before uh, the industry changes hit too. Yeah, sorry about that. People are freaking out. It's, it's only 55,000 Plex. 55,000. <laughs> it's still a lot. And... It's, it's still only like $2,000 worth of Plex. But... <laughs> yeah, well, I got another year to get it all back up so those were my industry alts they're pretty much my my industry alts that are on my um just like main accounts and on alt pilots and stuff they're pretty much getting me through now i'm running probably 350 to 400 jobs consistently um just doing reactions and that kind of stuff and getting ready for uh you know another yz9 or an m2 i'm not building the hulls yet just uh just I kind of know what races I'm going to be building, so I'm just kind of building up those as uh, as I can get the the parts and stuff at at a cheap price, and just uh, just starting to stockpile what I can. So about this Plex moving back up, this seems to correspond with and it could be anything, but it seems to correspond with the announcements, which were very late in March, about production changes. I'm wondering if it has anything to do with that. Yeah, like like I like I said, right? I think that the uh, there, there could be people buying and selling Plex so that they can fund the capital because these new blueprints are pretty expensive. The new right. uh, reaction blueprints are like three mil, six mil a piece for some of them. But uh, it actually went up, so it looks like more people maybe just resubbed accounts. So you could, you know, someone might resub their production alt, so they could just put in a bunch of builds before the before the end of the the industry changes. There's yeah. also, if you go back to the previous thing that you had, uh, the other one, the uh, matter all, the back. thing, there's actually something really interesting that happens in the middle of May. Yeah. Yeah, so you see there that blue, that 
big blue spike in the middle of May. That's demand that the space has been maltreated, and there's a huge amount that goes up in the middle of May. So uh, th there could be two reasons for that, right? It, it could be uh, that was when CCP had the uh, Eve anniversary event, uh, where they were giving away the Praxis, the Gnosis, and a bunch of skill points for free. I think it was like 380,000 skill points or something. So that was a pretty lucrative time to uh, to plex, especially if you're doing skill farming or something, because you got a lot more back if you sold the Praxis, Gnosis, and the extra skill points that you got. It could also interestingly be uh, because the CSM election was in the next month, right? So maybe some people uh, flexed a bunch of characters so that they could uh, vote in the CSM election. You're buying the ability to vote. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we did have 2,000 oh, yeah. more than uh, previous year. Yeah, and then you can just see like the, the red line uh, slowly creeps up and it's now surpassed the blue line. So that means that the, the number of unfulfilled biodas on the market is actually now higher than the amount that's actually traded. So you can expect probably to see flex prices to continue going up. Right. What's interesting too, is I was looking at uh, a little more on the economy here. I was looking at skill injectors and how they uh, aren't really trending with Plex. They normally do, they lag, but they normally trend with Plex, but it just doesn't seem to be translating. And if you look closely, there seems to be, as the price does go up at the very end, uh, there seems to be a drop in in demand here for for injectors. So I was wondering uh, what what that says, if anything. Okay, we'll get rid of that. And and the other thing I wanted to look at besides uh, Plex, and this is something Kenneth can comment on, is battleships appear to be right back where they were, if not lower than before, which is something that was something that we talked about move this out of the way and bring this back up. So here's one example. The um, Abaddon is now 250 million, uh, down from 270 before the announcements of changes to industry. You have the uh, Megatron, 250, and so on. If I look at the Raven, it's now at 270. It's about the same as it was before. And one of each races. Here's the Minmatar one. Uh, 260 was 280. Now, the, there are two Minmatar battleships that are not quite under where they were before the production change announcements, but all other battleships have reached parity with what they were before the announcements uh, or are lower. Yeah, that's... You know, we talked about this a lot when it came out, and there was a lot of the sky is falling and oh my God and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, once people got their processes down, uh, items became available and all of the market shenanigans stopped, uh, the price is dropping. We, we knew that it would drop. However, I'm it's below what it was when the dev blog came out. I'm kind of waiting for them to get down closer to where they were before the war and all started. Um, and it, that may take a little while. I don't think they'll ever get that far, but all of the chicken littles out there have been absolutely proven wrong, just like every other dev blog that's come out in ecosystem in the past year, year and a half. Everyone freaks out initially, and then it turns out, hey, yeah, you were wrong. And it's gonna continue like this. It's just whether or not they get to an equilibrium point before the next dev blog comes out. And it's, everything's in flux right now, nothing we can do about it, but I am glad that they are coming down in price. And this was even after the 1v1 battleship weekend where a lot of battleships died. Um, so that's a good sign. Um, you know, scarcity still sucks, got it. Uh, that sounds like our weekly meeting every week on the CSM, but mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the prices are coming down uh, I don't know how much further they'll drop. A lot of it has to do with minerals at this point. Minerals are tanking because there's no real pressure on them because no one's building capitals. Capitals don't take as many minerals as before. There's not as many minerals in the game. So, you know, there's a lot of lot of strings there that you have to pull to get to the yellow brick road. And, uh, you know, the next dev blog will be right around the corner. I don't know when it'll be, but, you know, it's coming. And that'll throw everything back into chaos again. Yeah, okay, the good news is uh, battle cruisers are now uh, as cheap as they were in 2019 before scarcity. Like I think Ferroxes are like 47 mil now. So yeah, cruisers the, as well. 
Yeah. So some of the pushback is, well, nobody's buying the battleships. That's a bad sign for the economy. Do you think that's... But that's well, a people buying battleships. That's, yeah. That's, that's also a different problem, right? They're buying battleships because they're not as good. Um, so that's out of the ecosystem's hands now. And that's more a problem for Team Talos. They need to balance the battleships to make people want to aspire to them and use them. So that's, I mean, it's still ecosystem team, but it's a different different team within there that needs to work on getting that done. Yeah, there's still a big issue as well with the, the price of uh, Morphite too. And one of the reasons I think that why minerals are so cheap right now is because a lot of people are mining out the belts in uh, in Nolsec so that they can respawn the Mkotsics. That's where all the money is. So, you know, like a lot of Zidrine and Megasite is crashing because people are just, you know, mining out their Colossal so it respawns so that they can get more Mkotsic from it. You're, you're talking to one of the... The, the big dealers of uh what is it you deal in kenneth well fine huh? oh yeah i go through millions yeah uh i'm drawing a blank is it uh, what you just you just said it Sutonia. what is it more fight uh, more fight yeah. it's used in almost all tech 2 production yeah yeah and that's uh something that kenneth deals a lot with i think is that a secret i hope not no, it isn't, it isn't no, anymore. No, I mean, it's tech two. Mostly what I build is tech two. Mm -hmm. And the, the capital guns just take absolute gobs and gobs of it. So it's not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty open about that stuff because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. Anyone in PL knows. Uh, so, I mean, it's by no means a secret. So it's just that it is hard to come by. Before the blog, the first blog where they did the redistribution of the, of the ore, um, they drop Marcoxit, which is what you mine to get Morphite by 90% in Nullsec. And price went from, I think it was as low as 10 or 12,000 a unit. And now it's up to like 75,000 a unit. And for some things now it's more than 50% of the price, which is crazy. Um, so like anything else, gonna have to wait for the next uh, blog to drop and see if that stirs the pot a little bit. And there we go. All right. The, um, there's one other thing, the jump freighters, very few of them on, I don't need to show those graphics, but if you look on the market, jump freighters, not a lot on the market. That was something you pointed out, Kenneth. Okay. So, uh, that's it for the economy stuff. I want to talk about just a, a look at it two months later. That's something that we did, um, during the week. You could catch it on the Monday show where we talk about war and economy. All right, let's get to uh, the Alliance Tournament here. I'm going to bring in um, an Alliance Captain team, but uh, I don't know, Rain, do you want to tell us what's what's going on there? The Alliance Tournament? So back in 2019, CCP um, canceled the Alliance Tournament. They said they didn't have the – was either something about the resources or the dev focus on it. Um, I always had assumed – I because people have pointed this out to me. I just assumed they couldn't didn't have the community aspect from it in 2019 because of the World Tour. But anyway, they canceled it in 2019. 2020 went by. We heard nothing. 2021 happens, and CCP Aurora has brought it back. So AT17 coming in November. Um, there's a lot of hype for it. Rules drop tomorrow. So I know a lot of folks have questions, but those will not be answered till tomorrow when the rules come out. So, yeah. All right, you might recognize uh, Casper has joined us. Say hi, Casper. What's up, guys? Hey. Let's see. He's the guy in the orange shirt there, obviously. And uh, he is very well known among Alliance Tournament circles. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, just so people get an idea of your knowledge. Uh, hi, my name is Casper. I have played AT since AT10, I think. I was on a practice team, and then 11 through, I was on either Hydra or PL, or some variation of one of them. Um, that's about all mm -hmm. I do. On TQ, I hide in a little wormhole, and we'll do like four jumps one or the other way, but that's about it. I'm mm -hmm. pretty trash at everything Eve, unless <laughs> I'm on grid, if I'm actually honest. But man, AT is back, and I am so freaking hyped. Um, when that announcement got dropped, literally the Discord just lit up old hats from you know five to ten years ago, just like started shooting. We doing a team, we doing a team, we doing a team. So freaking stoked! Uh, thank you, CCP, and anybody on, in here that has done it, Rain, Setonia. Thank you guys for pushing this. If you did, uh, freaking stoked. 
Great. Uh, also, you do the Negative 10 podcast, right? Yeah, I okay. should have maybe said something about that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I'm involved in that. <laughs> That's a good podcast. Less than 10, no, negative Less than 10. 10. Right? <laughs> negative Sorry. 10 or minus 10 is Pandemic Legion. That's Pandemic Legion, right? I'm not going to lie. Before I was involved in that, I literally thought that was a PL chat. I'm like, why Why do I want to go there? This is a PL chat. Screw this. But then he's like, oh, this is a Less Than 10 podcast. Gotcha. Yeah, it's just a few. It's just one symbol off, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sounds off. All right. Well, um, take us through it, uh, Stargazer. Like, you're going to be involved in this, right? You're going to be helping actually create the tournament. Um, just give us a broad overview of uh, what this tournament looks like, maybe how it's different from previous years, if, if, you, if you know that yet. We, we're going to get the rules Monday, is that right? Yeah, the, the majority of the rules will come out uh, explaining, you know, the difference between this alliance tournament and previous alliance tournaments. The majority of the information that we don't know about will obviously come out tomorrow. Um, we know at the moment, obviously, that it's going to be a, a, a double elimination. Um, same sort of format in terms of number of teams, um, in terms of, you know, the amount of pilots, the ship points and things like that. Yeah, that's all sort of details uh, coming out tomorrow. We know that Mordus Legions are the sponsor for this this uh, alliance tournament so we know that it's going to be um it's going to be a bit of a, a very well balanced um alliance <laughs> tournament all right a little um people don't know this but the first article that i wrote uh was people didn't even know i was a writer before i was a, a podcaster was the history of alliance tournaments and uh you got me hyped up on this stargazer when you put to put that eon magazine article up and i was like yeah i remember that it was the caldari championships that was it and it was a a, a battleship a frigate and a cruiser so it was three man teams and that was it uh so they fought it out and all of a sudden it was popular and they said let's do it again and there was the beginning of the alliance tournament yeah, I mean, it started it started relatively small, and you know, as as time's gone on, they've increased the team sizes. They've um, obviously the production value increased incredibly over the years. Um, a lot of, amusingly, a lot of the old uh, commentators ended up becoming you know developers as mm -hmm. well at CCP over time. Um, CCP, yeah, th yeah. Th there's been a there's been a yeah. lot. I mean, like. Um, we should Steve ESG, uh, oh, right. CCB Falcon, there's been, uh, I mean, yeah, there's, there's been absolutely loads. Uh, but yeah, the, the popularity kind of grew, and as the popularity kind of grew, the, so did like the size of the Alliance, well, it's not even just the Alliance tournament, the, the tournaments in general, I mean, it obviously went from uh, the Amar Championships, let's say the Caldari ones, and then you ended up with the, the huge thing that was the Alliance tournament. It was the big tournament that people looked forward to each year. Yeah, we should designate, I mean, we should make clear that there was the, um, what were they called? The trials. Well, there's a name for them, right? The succession trials. Succession yeah. trials, right. So those are based in lore about the Amarian Empire that has like five families or, or five houses and their kids basically fight over the crown and they take it. And that's something that players can be the champion for a certain house. And we've seen that only twice in EVE, and one was like one year after EVE started. It was a long time ago. So after that happened initially, then the Kaldari Championships were, or Kaldari Gaming Championships were basically EVE or CCPs like it was their events team. And so didn't they RP like Kaldari Championship Society, what is it called? Championship Commission or something. Yeah, so the uh, Intergalactic Gaming Commission, That's the gaming. IGC, yeah, is okay. essentially what the the in-game. Uh, I, I guess the way you could phrase it as is like your in-game gambling commission. They're the ones that decide. Um, you know, the actual in the law, they're the ones who decide the uh, the, the who does what in terms of uh, what the tournament scene is. But yes, it is based as a uh, a Kaldari corporation because money is good for the Kaldari. That's what apparently. they do. Right. So, so it was kind of them RPing the events team into the game and then they could set up these events and you had like death races and then you had this alliance tournament thing. And then and then it became the alliance tournament and started growing in popularity, I think, because the alliances participated. The big alliances on the board, the ones that were famous, were the ones that were participating. So you had the Bob team versus the Razor team, let's say. I don't know if Razor was there early, but they were well known. Um, and so you started seeing like, like a real investment from the players who were in organized groups, big groups, 
But then it became over time, and I'm talking years and years, it became so professionalized with people like Casper that, and you're, you know, whoever's, well, like Casper, <laughs> that it wasn't really attached to, not to take anything away from you guys, but it wasn't really attached to the, the actual, you know, um, members of alliances. And it feels like the connection started to get broken. And then I think what happened is you have like more, it became more like NASCAR or something where you have such a good and elite driving team that all you really have is buy-in through sponsorship from alliances. And so it feels like this is our team. And I look at NC Dot, right? NC Dot doesn't have an alliance team from its member base. It basically bought one and put it in there. Uh, and or, or was that Nully? That might have been Nully, but uh, yeah, it's the Nully Seconda team that joined uh, NC, right? Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the better teams in the tournament. They only come like fourth place, led by N Nidispar, who you've heard of, or Ajax Thirty Three, as he's known in the tournament circuit. But the point is, like, it's like a core of people that are inside the actual alliance, not the alliance itself. What do you What do you think about that? I mean, I think that's it's going to vary a lot between alliances, right? So yes, there is a there is a huge volume of people that obviously end up attending the alliance tournament, but it it is of alliances of varying size, right? So you may have absolutely huge alliances, but then you know you may only have a small a core group of people that potentially potentially are, um, I mean typically less than 10 pilots that are going to be participating in the alliance tournament but then you may not be an absolutely you know huge alliance with massive amounts of holdings you may be a small alliance but because you're always playing in like a small group you may end up doing particularly well i mean what actually comes to mind is again like templis calcef who have done really well over the last um, few tournaments when you consider that their origins is actually in Kaldari faction warfare. You know, they're not a massive solve holding alliance originally. So yes, you have big groups which may only have, you know, a small number of people that participate in the alliance, but that, that's not the only, you know, size that, uh, that contribute and do well. Suetonia, I should have put you in Casper's group. Of course, you're great at the alliance tournament as well. <laughs> And Rain, you've been announcing there. You guys are all involved in the Alliance Tournament. I'm going to sit back and let you guys talk about the Alliance Tournament. Hey, I'm just tied to this back, man. I'm, I'm really, really uh, happy about it. Uh, oh. I have a question for Casper, actually. Uh, oh, what do you it. think about the, uh, the the prior ships being reissued? Because I'm very much on the fence about it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that it means that CSP can bring back the Alliance Tournament every year. Because, you know, it means that they don't need as much developer resources. And it pretty much... Can, like CSP Aurora, I think we can continue doing it. But like the 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 eighty prior ships being like a part of history of, of Eve, you know, it kind of erases that a little bit. Although uh, I, I'm really hoping that they do the the idea uh, that was suggested where they like make like a Mimma first edition or something, you know, and maybe give like a, a prize prize skin or something for free to everyone who already has a Mimma when they like re, re release them. Um, as a collector. I'm pretty pissed just because, you know, it drives the value down because there's more. But as a user of them, I'm actually freaking stoked. I think it's going to be, you know, more people buying and selling them. So it's going to drive maybe market up because right now nothing's moving at all. Maybe it's because of scarcity and nobody has this. I don't know. But nobody, everybody is trying to sell AT ships and nobody's buying. So I hope that that changes and that more people will fly them because now it's not all, you know, Summer Blink and 30 of them banned. 10 years ago now there's going to be tons more on the market and people get to use them and as you said if it's you know this is a first edition where well, you only have you know a, a second edition frecky get owned you're kind of a loser if that kind of stuff starts happening i'm going to be stoked like cool you have a first edition that that's cool it just adds you know um people knowing about these people using them people dying to them it gives frederick von hole some more stuff to do some more reddit posts to go salt on you know so i'm actually t totally okay with it I know I was initially opposed to it, but seeing the way CCP Aurora, so CCP Aurora did the announcement and seeing how she approached it, I thought was a really solid, like in between. Um, but yeah, I think having more of them out there, 
definitely is better for the game, especially because they're so unique um, to everything. I really wish we could have it like Serenity, where we could just all get them for free sometimes and just fly them around. Oh, and God, no. <laughs> like, just imagine. I think that would just be so much fun. Or maybe we can put them all on CC or something, but I think that would be entertaining. I mean, you can pretty much get any AT ship on CC if you just, like, ask Casper. <laughs> Well, Having maybe them all on Sissy but... would be cool, though, for everyone to just be able to fly them. I do totally agree with that. Because then, honestly, if you get to go fly them over there, then you're going to want to come back to DQ and buy them from me. So that would be cool. Also, another bonus, really, if they start do if they do this re-release thing every 10 years, if they did a balance pass at the same time, that would be really, really, really cool. Because they've all gotten power creeps so hard that they're really not usable, let's be honest. They're more hangar queens. Yeah, wouldn't it be uh, wouldn't it be amazing if the Mimo wasn't worse than the actual stock unit? Dude, honestly, it's like legitimately rupture class. It's uh, it looks cool. It looks gorgeous. That and the the Freki, they're amazing looking, but you just can't use them. So I hope that that changes with this re-release and maybe a balance pass. Yeah, Aurora um, hinted at that too. Oh, sorry, go on, Kenneth. Well, no, a lot of people don't realize that the actual AT number is printed on the side of the ship too. So. I don't know if they'll, you know, that's going to require art assets to get those removed and updated. That's just not a skin. So there is going to be a little bit of work in re-releasing them. Um, in addition to anything they put in the nomenclature or whatever for a new class. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of on the fence too. As someone who's sitting on, uh, you know, 10 to 12 trillion of worth of, I think there's 111 hulls we have left or something. So, you know, that's quite a bit of is to get devalued. Should spend it. You get 10 years. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other thing, too. Yeah, most of the old ones are gone. We only have just enough left for the tournament. But the, the other thing is, is they're not letting them in the tournament. Um, so that kind of bums me out as well, because that's the, the general use case for them. And you can't fly them. Is that I mean, just this year? Or I mean, Antonia, you might be able to know the rules uh, better than it, I did. It's not. To, like, I think we we talked about this. I think it, it isn't specifically uh, going forwards. Like they could uh, allow AT ships in the future, but this year uh, in particular, there is no AT ships allowed. Yeah, you know, obviously we can't talk about you know conversations we've had, but you know, right now all we know is they're not they're not able to be used. Um, you know, I, I'm. I know Suetonia pushed for them to to be used in the future, and so did I. But again, we we don't get to make the rules. I think the flip side of that is like I can understand that it's a huge barrier of entry when you think that your team can't participate at like a, an extremely high level because you don't have the ISK investment to spend on a limited edition run ship. So it means that potentially it, it's a more even playing field for all all the teams it comes down more to comp and pilot skill rather than having who has the, the huge amount of isk yes if you have a huge amount of isk you can potentially throw that into your flagship but at least it's not just on you know who has the biggest collection of alliance tournament ships right yeah but i mean the, the in, flip side of that though is your prizes are worthless no i wouldn't say that you you're still gonna just because people, they get used in the alliance tournament doesn't mean that they're only going to get used in the alliance tournament Tanas are never used on Tranquility. As somebody yeah. totally uses a, a Tana, they are never used on Tranquility. Yeah, but I mean, generally the hanger queens, the hangers are full, right? So if someone already has an Itana, a Rabasu, and a Maracha, and the second editions come out, they're not going to say, ooh, I want the second edition. They're not going to bother. So your, your prizes are going to be worth considerably less probably 80 to 90 percent less than if they were still being used in the tournament and you could turn them over to the other teams there was a lot of trading back in the what uh 8 to 12 13 range we have first and second place they'd change normally five or ten ships between them as a as a swap kind of like they do now where first place gets like 25 cruisers 25 frigates where in the old days the winners got all the cruisers second place got all the frigates they would immediately swap 10 ships or so that way each team had a little bit of both um that that part of it's taken out but still you know the, you got to have a use case for these ships you can't be putting them into the game and you know expect people to use them on tq or just have hanger queens I mean, they're more expensive than titans 
Mm. Yeah, the the other the other like downside too, right? Is uh, some of the the best AT moments are when like prior ships uh, end up getting destroyed. Like uh, in AT thirteen, I think the Pandemic Legion versus uh, Camel Empire. If there are, I think they're under that name. But the, that there was a single match where I think like five AT prior ships were destroyed, and the actual is destroyed in value in that one AT match was actually more than the Battle of Asakai. Wow. Just and that's at those prices, you know. Today, the the prices yeah. of them are stupid. Seeing, I'm just talking about the tournament side of this again. Um, that barrier to entry is actually huge. You know, being on always the teams that we had them, I didn't really think too much of it. But we just went through the Alliance Open a while ago, and there was a thing, a rule in there called wild card, where somebody could use a unique. All this is on TD, so you know everybody had one. They could use it against us. Well, that's a huge thing to think about because we can only use our wild card once, but every team we're going to go up and face, oh, we're Hydra, we're a big name, they're going to use their wild card against us every single time. So it puts us at a deficit, and that was kind of eye-opening for me as a player that you know hasn't been on the lower is side that, oh, hell, now even in banning, you're going to have to ban Ruby Suatana, or I'm going to bring it, and even if we're not, this is a wasted ban on us. So... I think it's actually a super smart thing, at least right now on CCP, to not allow them, honestly. It gives you a better playing field. It gives, you know, as we said, no-name teams like Calcif that came in that honestly we didn't think anything of, and we got our butts whooped. I don't know what I can say. And so that's just a good thing for the community right. scene in a whole. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> honestly, like, it, it's a good thing, and it makes it more fair, and I think you have better competition, and there will be teams that, you know, want to play, but they'll start looking at the rules, and they'll be like, oh, we don't have 10 uniques and 4 trillion to throw at this. I'm not even going to participate. So I think it's a good, a good rule in that way. I think the other interesting thing when you mentioned Templus is the fact that they got through the entire alliance open without using their wildcard as well. Oh, it, it was outstanding. We got our butts whipped handedly three years in a row. They're a, a great team. So it just shows that you know it can be done, and I'm I'm stoked that they're going to come back and we're going to beat them this year. Sometimes it's, it's not really... It's kind of funny how Templus is, uh, how far Templus has come to, right? So, like, in AT, like, 15, they were like, oh, lol, Kadari roleplayers. And then, uh, you know, now they, uh, they've won the Alliance Open and the Anger games, like, back-to-back, -back, basically. Yeah, they also, I think, the, was it the Templus team? It might have been another team that had been doing, like, the player run tournaments, too. So they're not just, like, this group that's come out of nowhere. They've, they've at least dedicated a lot of time and a lot of effort into these tournaments. But I think just like having the threat of somebody bringing something spooky is bigger than what they actually bring. Because with tournaments, you can always hype yourself up and like, you know, get too anxious and kind of like tunnel vision and things, especially like with the banning phase and what you're bringing versus what you're not bringing. Yeah, and like the biggest uh, advantage the AT ships, I, I think, was not necessarily the power level that they were, but just the fact that they could uh, avoid bans. Like Rubisu Rubi can avoid like Armalogy ban and. Uh, Tana can av avoid uh, like Basilisk Scimitar ban, for example. Although the Atana was also unlocked like a super unique like uh, like uh, turtle comp that you can't really do with a uh, Basilisk. Yeah, it's been interesting. It's also fun now too because the bans in the past used to only be two, and I think one year it was up to three, and so like that kind of dynamic changed the tournaments. So we'll see tomorrow how CCP intends to do the Alliance tournament bans and sort of what they're. Well, I think they already said right. They said it's going to be a, like a blind ban from the from the Alliance tournament open. So you you both submit. I think it's two or three bans. I can't remember how much it it, it is. Just like the AT Open, and if you both select the same thing, then you you all both pick another ban. So I think, like in the AT Open, I think you could get like six or seven ships banned, like total, like between both sides, and like the most crazy option. Or what was it nine? I think right. Like you had three bands each, and if you all submitted if the same three bands for the first thing, then you yeah. and then chose like three unique ones afterwards, you'd have like nine band total, which is kind of crazy. It's like it really destroys like like almost every setup. Yeah. That's yeah, I guess. Be... Sorry, go on. For... No, 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 go on. It's going to be kind of crazy this year. Obviously, the Alliance Open was on Thunderdome, so you could spawn ships really, really quickly and just have them there. Well, what if, you know, your team's ready and you have two or three comps ready, and then there's nine bands? Well, now you're on TQ. You have to go to Jita. You have to figure out how to buy this stuff, get to wherever you're staging if it's not Jita, get these fit rights, and get all this uh, traded out to your team members. 
And if you're in a best of, that's in like 10 or 15 minutes. So that's something that a lot of people don't think about. You know, it, it gets really, really hardcore having this on TQ again. And it's a whole nother side of it that nobody got to practice on the, the TV ones. Yeah, you also have to be careful that you don't bring uh, four destroyers uh, by mistake when, <laughs> when your comp gets banned. This is what I was about to say, so it also introduces a very interesting level when it comes to uh, actually refereeing and double checking, triple checking to make sure that the uh, the captains haven't bought an invalid comp. When you have a list of, you know, as Casper as says, like nine different banned ships, it's relatively easy to either like double hull or triple hull or quadruple hull the wrong type of ship or, you know, bring an valid comp so when you when you end up with a very large ban list you end up with a very complicated potential you know fleet so it's uh it's it's it, pre it presents an interesting challenge for sure general are there any um maybe behind the scenes leaks that have got through that maybe we don't know about that you could leak that any any mistakes that have been made that haven't been made public I mean, the, amusingly, when during a, a lot of the old previous tournaments, the uh, the referee chat is segmented away from uh, <laughs> ev everybody else's prying eyes, uh, because we have we we do share some very amusing. Um, invalid comps that people end up creating or you know that we catch people out trying to do uh particularly shady things um we've had some funny ones i i don't think there's any that i i, I can share okay. but yeah for, for sure there's been some you know a couple of people trying to bring um implants that they shouldn't do ammo types that they shouldn't do there's just you know lots of little little things here and there and it's like you you call them out and they're like really Hang on a minute. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. They, they try, try and play innocent. We still have hangers and hangers and hangers full of 20% ammo. I mean, it is insane the amount of 20% ammo that we have. Yeah, I oh. think uh, I think uh, Dalico, who was like a guy in turn left, like had 80 bill of it. And then as soon as he's banned, banned it, his like 80 bill of ammo went down to like 20 bill or something in about like <laughs> 10, a few weeks. The market metagame, but also I, that's another point of the, the tournament being on like tranquility. I remember, was it one year where CCP gave out like these bonus drugs? And so people would just take them because like you also got, I think, like learning implants with it too. And then during the tournament, they're like, oh, I have this drug and it gives me extra damage and tank and I can't get rid of it because it, it lasts through me potting myself. What do I do? So CCP had to like go through the list of characters and clear their drugs because they weren't able to use it. But it was something CCP gave for free initially. So it kind of created this like catastrophe of getting characters cleared because they weren't trying to cheat. Yeah, we had that a couple of times during the Alliance Open where someone had in, uh, actually taken uh, a booster before the actual match. And it's like... Uh... No, we can see that that is running on you, and you can't play in your next game with it. It's like, oh, okay. I guess I'll go kill myself then. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's that's in game, of course, right? But yeah, yeah, uh, of course, of course. Yeah. But, but potentially, right? There's there's maybe an issue there now that you can redeem drugs in space, where people oh. are gonna have to like keep an eye on that, right? From the daily logins, you get like you know exile boosters or whatever in there. So for sure, I mean, some people who try to cheat. The referee tool is actually a pretty pretty powerful thing that you can you can see literally minute to minute, second to second, um, whether people are doing what they should be doing or or not. Um, I'm still waiting for the day that I can just fire off and erase someone who tries to cheat mid game. Um, at the moment, we just have the fun of mo moving them outside the boundary or moving them within the boundary to a different location. If it's if it's rule breaking, but not completely game breaking. But for the most part people have behaved yeah. ludicrous in the chat had a pretty good question with these prizes on the line which are worth you know trillions can you just buy everything in the game like in jita and yes this happens three percent implants um slept nears in the past it's part of the teams we'll go and buy everything we can to get an advantage so some other team can't do it it's definitely market games are a, a big 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 thing there's also market manipulation that happens too, right? where people deliberately like buy out all of a certain thing. Like you buy out all of the claymores and like skirmish mine links in Jitter, then you relist them, and then you see like team captains buy them from you. So I remember, I, I think D DHP Wildcat got ganked. I think like, in your <laughs> at one point trying to move to like AT uh, flagship. Flagship. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I remember there being a uh, one of the, the the spying element that was discussed on the last show of being a, a huge thing in the past is, you know, people buying those market orders and seeing who's buying it and you know deducing deducing who 
what the enemy team comp is going to be based off of what they purchased. Oh, which I think is a very sure. interesting, interesting. Oh yeah, there used to be like, tons of funny things you used to, you used to be able to do yeah. when uh, CSP let you test on Sissy, and when they let you test on the other something, it was duality. There was all of uh, like funny, mean things we did to people. Do you, do you have some past stories to tell, Suetonia? Oh well, there, there was one funny thing, right? Uh, the the on duality used to have like a, a password that you had to type in to be able to uh, go into like so, someone's system. CSP gave everyone a system. And there was a password for it. It was really weird. You put it as your like post password. So uh, like I just had an alt that was like sitting outside the person's system, and I was just constantly descanning. Like because I think it was like Exodus and Triumvirate or some other team were practicing against each other, and I was descanning because a common mistake people make is they set their ship name to their PO their POS password. <laughs> and so I, I got I got the POS password from the test for that one. So I was able to get into their system and and go to like a safe spot in the arena and they changed the password after that but if you're already in it doesn't actually kick you out so you're you basically you're like you can just leave your characters like stuck in there until the until the downtime comes so it's pretty yeah. funny like that there's also a lot of other like really funny uh like spying testing stuff yeah one other thing that happened to us is right after citadels we put up a citadel as our um as our home base for the alliance tournament and then like a week before the tournament, they're like, oh yeah, uh, you actually can't enter the tournament from a Citadel, you have to be in a station. So we were freaking out, freightering umpteen billion ships <laughs> from the Citadel to the station because we didn't have time to asset safety. So we had to freighter them all to the station so that they'd be available uh, in station. And I, I hope they allow play from Citadels this time, but something tells me that uh, probably not going to happen it will more than likely yeah. still be stations yeah and i know yeah, the was... thing about that about that too uh kenneth is uh, back then that was before ccp uh uh didn't stop you from destroying citadels on on sissy to see what's inside of them so for some people who were staging from a uh a citadel on singular on tq if the mirror had already happened on sissy you could blow up the citadel and see like what ships are inside the, the citadel that goes back to like Casper's point too, where you know, if when you're on tranquility, you only have like 15 minutes between matches. So if they ban everything, so that comes into the market manipulation, where if you're selling stuff and you know you ban something that your opponent loves to bring, you can sit there and watch what kind of ships they buy or what modules or you know some of the logic stuff. So you can definitely see like the whole meta spying game behind the AT is like super in depth, and I feel like there's so much missing information because nobody wants to talk about it because it's still going on. So it's one of those things where it's like a hidden gem of Eve because the Alliance tournament's great, but all this stuff behind the scenes is what makes it beautiful. So, Casper, who are some of the guys that are coming back that you're excited to see? Did you mention names? Uh, I haven't, but sure. Um, moderator. So, oh, moderator. Moderator. Yeah, oh, cool. <laughs> uh, Hart show is showing up. Uh, Snow's going to be here. Duncan is showing up. Uh, Soldat, the old school Laji pilot, is coming back. Um, it's going to be pretty good. It's kind of a weird mix of skill you guys like Dexter and Jordan, and then the old school Hydra guys, Blue Heart, you know, Snow and Duncan, and then some of the newer Gordon or Gordon Gorwin Clade members. So it's it's a weird mesh of all these people that are. It's going to be interesting what happens. And then, so Tony, I'm going to put you on the spot. You 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 coming over yet? Just saying. Uh, I mean, it depends if I end up. Uh... Uh, being an analyst on the thing or not all right but yeah it's, it's going to be super super fun you know all these iterations of hydra that we've gone through and now this came back and it brought everybody out of the woodwork so it, it's going to be fun to see what happens. yeah i mean and speaking of the people who came uh, out of the woodwork capku is back in the game <laughs> can you confirm this i have him on my friends list and he actually logged in the other day yeah, he was spotted. I think Rich Richmond actually put up a, a camera. He was going to be a paparazzi and go take pictures. So that was kind of funny. <laughs> That's just to make Capcom man. Poor yeah, guy. Exactly. That's why he was doing it. Um, so were you guys teammates, Casper and Suetonia, on Hydra? Uh, yeah, we've been on like several teams together. I think we were on like AT13, AT15, and AT... Well, I wasn't on AT16 team, but Casper was. Yep, yep. Hmm. Uh, in a team like yours, where any one of you are exceptionally good at this game, combat anyway, um, is there an FC or how do you coordinate? 
Yeah, that's normally someone who's uh, calling targets and calling the shots. But I mean, everyone needs to be independent and like. So uh, you know you. Right. It's definitely controlled chaos over comms. There's some recordings of, of what goes on. It is literally everyone shouting over everyone, and somehow we make it work. But generally, there's a target caller and a backup caller, and then there's a frigate, uh, kind of a frigate FC that tells what's going on, and then there's an Ewar FC for any, you know, Mollus, Kitsune, Carries, Rooks, whatever. And then you got your Lodgy. And so all of these people are talking over each other the entire time. And it, it works because you, you've been testing for three, four months. Literally, you know, if you think about it on TQ, you get, what, one or two fights a day. Well, uh, when you're testing, you're getting 10 to 12 fights in like a three or four hour period. And this happens every single day as the tournament gets closer. So you get to know each other really, really, really well. And you can hear all 10 voices talking over each other really well. And I think, honestly, more important than piloting because at the top five to seven teams. I think piloting is all very similar, but it's your communication and decision-making that can happen in those stressful moments that will set the better teams up from you know the, the run of the mill mm -hmm. teams. So it's, a, so it's like a sports team where the guys are all communicating with each other constantly as they're playing mm -hmm. the game, that sort of yep. thing. And, and is, I've only seen the, the TNT team play at a high level uh, and they had an anchor and they were all anchoring around that person. Is that something you guys do? <laughs> No, I have not never. seen us do this. Um, we can try just for a me. No, 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 it won't fucking happen. <laughs> yeah. All right. You, you you would never anchor up in an AT. I mean, unless you're on a boundary one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was, there was actually a team. I think in AT fifteen in the feeder rounds. I think it was Legio or something. I can't remember their name, but they uh, they, they they all anchored up on a single guy, and they went, ended up they, they were actually winning the match, and then the anchor just went outside the arena, and then they all died. They were winning the match, and then they did one they of those winning, new, actually. the new Black Ops jump where they took the whole team with them, and just <laughs> annihilated them. Didn't all. that one was comp, the inspiration? Didn't the one comp anchor where you had like the logi and all the energy transfer? Oh, and the turtle, tree? turtle tinker comps, yeah, yeah tinker comps tinker. too. Yeah, yeah I, they anchor up, but none of the rest of them do. Yeah, it was a Marauder, a uh, 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 logi ship, Tech Three or something, and then like four or five DPS around it type thing? Yeah. Generally, yeah. Those are propless, so it's pretty hard to mess up those ones because it's generally propless or AB only. Yeah, but, but you got boosters yeah. now. Well, I mean, of course you can mess up because you can, uh, you, can, you, can not, you can forget to like put auto reload off on your uh, XL instead of uh, the shield yeah. booster, right? Yeah, it, it's this, a shame, the shame that the afterlife did that. Otherwise, they would have uh, took PL down to the, the but boosters. That that tinker concept which uh, kenneth was saying was like stay close to each other and constantly repair and give each other capacity. yeah they, they've been like banned for the yeah. last few ats so uh, ever since he's did the rework on t3s they've banned the uh the you know like the subsystem that lets you use logistics uh on t3cs yeah. and they were banned because they're boring to watch basically i assume yeah for, for the most part yeah i was gonna really say to fly. like they're intense to fly yeah, it would. They would end up in a lot of turtles, especially if you got Tinker versus Tinker. You would just end up basically turtling until the speed thing came in, and then someone would die, and then mm. it would unravel quickly. But you had a long time to get there. All right. Well, I was say, go ahead. One of the one of the other funny things of uh, when you were talking about prop mods as well that the referee tool obviously picks up every module that you're using on the ship, and it's something that. We, we referees have sat and discussed in the past as well when we're looking at um, comps and they've got the wrong sized prop mod <laughs> on their fits. When you're sitting there thinking, shall I tell them? Shall I? No, no, it's it, it's it's your fault. You're gonna you're gonna be the uh, individual that's messed it up, and you're gonna be the point of everybody's amusement in this next game. All right, so the Alliance tournament uh, being back has got you guys really excited. It's got friends of Casper coming back to the game. This is this is high level competitive gameplay for you guys. Here's the pushback. It doesn't appeal to us, to players who play this game on a different level. You saw some of that disappointment in the announcement. People were projecting their own feelings onto what this announcement might be. Uh, the Alliance tournament announcement hits. Some of those guys go, oh, but you guys go, yeah. Finally, that's is this is awesome. Where is for you guys? Where is the way of recapturing that goodwill from other players? Do you guys, can you think of anything that should happen? 
Well, I, I think That's most no sick players are mad because of scarcity changes, right? For the most part. So. Do you think it's unrelated? Bring back Eve Bet. Eve Bet. What do you That's think, That's a really good problems. point, actually. Gamble, and maybe you can make some money. Don't need a mat rat or mine. Kenneth? The, yeah, the other thing is, is you just have to look at it in... Um, CCP is reinvesting in EVE, period. If you look at the community team now, the community team is back up to, what, five, six guys, Suetonia, something like that. So yeah. they are putting money into the game that you can see. Now, the scarcity thing, yeah, I got it. I don't like it any more than anybody else. But the fact that CCP are putting money into the game, period, is yeah. a good sign. Now, will it take a little bit longer for ecosystems, scarcity, and everything to catch up? Yes, because you can't just you, you can't just you know have one dev guy undo that in a day. But the fact that CCP are putting money into the game, putting money into the tournament, they're flying all of EVNT to Iceland to run it type thing. There's a lot of money being spent, and that should be a good sign to anyone playing the game. Period. Now, did you get your little lollipop first? No, sorry. But at the end of the day, someone's getting a lollipop and yours is, you know, next. You're just getting your teeth cleaned right now. You get your lollipop after. So it's coming. If, if I could piggyback on that to make a larger point, it's, I was talking to somebody who was new saying, do you think CCP is just doing money grabs all over the place to ride this dying game out of existence? And I thought, no, this is the opposite of that. That might have been true 2016 through 2019 where they're doing a ton of Plex sales, making themselves beautiful as a company to be sold to a different company. Uh, it could have been true when they were letting everybody have a Titan, letting everybody have alts, letting everybody spend Plex money to build these income systems that were just completely out of whack for any kind of future for EVE, the abundance era that you guys were in. And the people who came into the game feel like that's the norm. It wasn't like that before. And now CCP is saying, okay, we got bought. These guys want us to stay around. We're going to stay around. We got to get this game back into shape, lose all those uh, extra abundancy pounds and get into fighting shape. It's going to hurt because training for something hurts uh, to get back into shape. So if anything, uh, the scarcity era is a sign that CCP is investing in this game for a long term future. They announced that when they first started it. And I think it's absolutely true. What do you guys think? Completely. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, if C if CSP wanted to milk the player base, like they would just release like Tech Two Rockles and Tech Two Titans and go the complete, you know, <laughs> opposite way. Casper. So then that way they could they could get like you know a bunch of uh, money for skill injectors and flex out of people before the servers went down. Like this is uh, just CSP invested in the future of the game. I agree completely with what Sonia just said. Rather than just, you know, power creeping the game to get people to, you know, buy more skill points, buy more ships, whatever, they're taking it back. Um, I've played this game longer than I want to stuck say. I played it in 2004, okay? I've been around a little while. The amount of changes in the last eight months is more than years and years and years and years before. And period for Eve, change is good. Yes, it's going to hurt some people, and we're going to get back you know, a, a ways, but we're moving forward. And change is good rather than just beating a dead horse that's already dead and we're not doing anything about it. Do you, I, go on. Stargazer, go ahead. I was going to say, so I, I mean, Casper may, may be able to even relate, but yeah, I completely agree. But the funny thing was, again, like 2003, 2004, I'm, I'm a 2003 player as well. So like back in the day, it felt really huge to have just built a battleship back in the day. Like when it, it was like a monumental achievement for yourself to actually have been able to the afford. The system knew if there was a battleship yeah. undocked, legit. Exactly. And that was one of the interesting things I found about this whole the whole scarcity issue was the fact that the battleships became super expensive. So it felt more of a monumental achievement again to like actually have managed to build one and fly one. So not only to have the skills, but to also um, actually you know afford to to fly the thing and potentially lose it. And I think having that kind of sense again that you know something is expensive and because it's big and because it's you know, worth investing in is a good thing in, in general towards the, the health of the game. Uh, Casper, yeah, just fly caracals, okay. you need to fly Osprey navies. Kenneth and then Casper, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, back, back then, 
we were just happy that Tuesday came and went and we can log in sometime Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> true. You know, so. and that was for that was for a patch that had nothing but bug fixes in it. Uh, you know, so the, the game has, has come quite a ways. Uh, and, I, and, you know, knowing this is my second term on CSM, knowing where we started and kind of, uh, I don't think we've gotten the longer term roadmap. Sutinia probably hasn't seen that yet, but um, there's uh, there's some pretty cool things coming that they're going to try that uh, I think players haven't seen and definitely wouldn't be able to guess in a million years. And, uh, and they should be coming. It's going to be pretty cool. Rolling yes. the game, rolling the game back from hi. If you want to be a line member in any block, you need to have a super of facts and a battleship ready. That's BS. I'm sorry. A new player should not be forced to have a super cap, the second best ship in the game, to join a block. That that needs to be taken back so far, and that's going to really hurt a lot of people. But I'm sorry, you shouldn't be forced to have a super to be a line member. That's so dumb. I think this. Standards. Yeah, I think the uh, the squeeze is they feel the pressure to do that. The alliances, it's their responsibility to say, you know what, that was for a different time. We need to lower our entry requirements. Don't feel the pressure that you're falling behind. We're going to let you in, even if you can just fly a battleship. But Casper, I wanted to ask you, what do you think of the iteration speed that's happening now or fixes? They put something out, not sure it's quite right. They go back and they fix it. I love it. it. I love it. I love it. I don't even care if they take things too far. If it's known, if they take things too far and they can always bring it back. All right. No problem. But it shouldn't be. All right. They're going to make a change and Red is going to cry for six months. I'm sorry. This is a game where you should adapt and figure it out. And it makes it so the game isn't stagnant. All these changes. I don't care if it's a good or bad change. In my opinion, change is good. Just period. Yeah, the Marauder change, changes were a good example of that, where they like overtuned them really hard and then they brought them back a little more sensible. They've like tweaked the ESS like a bunch of times, so they're, they're like re they're like bringing back like some of the notification no so fleet scepters too. So yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. A long well, time even, ago, even the ore yeah. they tweaked. They added those Arcanor and Bisto uh, belts to each system and stuff uh, after they deleted all the belts. Uh, or no, after they delete all the belts and they put the rats on the gates. Um, so, I mean, you know, they're, they're fairly responsive, although some of it is self-inflicted that they had to respond to, but nevertheless. Yeah, uh, the quick iteration is, uh, to me, it seems like a dream come true for some players who were always complaining because there was a time, I think around when the Sveeple came out, CCP was interviewed, I think by us, and he said, what we like to do is is overcorrect and then slowly fix it to let things kind of settle out so they see what the players are actually doing with it before they go in and intervene. But they're not doing that anymore. It looks like they're really on top of like speed of getting it right to where they need it at the time. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, the latest one, Marauders, were like busted for like maybe four months. But that's probably like the, the most, the thing that's been like changed recently that's been busted the longest period of time, which is a pretty good uh, turnaround time. Yeah. Again, I think there's always this, I think CCP, what they try to do is when they fix a ship is they try to give it some time where it's OP to get it, you know, to, to let people like it again. And then they kind of like bring it back into... A little, little bit of bait. Uh, you know, yeah, it could be. Yeah. I mean, they, they didn't really do that with the income stuff though, right? They were they uh, kind of under tuned for a while. Yeah. The, the Kikimura was broken. Remember when the Kikimura had uh, 50 meters cubed of drones and it had more <laughs> grid? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, I honestly feel like the devs just want players to like use the ships, get it out there, get it sold, let people play with it, uh, and give it its day in the sun, I call it. And then you nerf it, but they're doing that really fast now. Which is... Yeah, but then, but then, uh, but then people make conspiracies where like, they're saying C Scaly does us and sell a bunch of skill injectors. Yeah, when it comes out and then sell a bunch of skill extractors when they nerf it, so people can move into the next flavor of the month thing. Yeah, the uh, the Rorca was the best example of like, hey, I just skilled up all this stuff, you know. Uh, but they gave it like three years, so whatever. All right. Yeah, C CCP yeah. has been hit by some absolutely positively horrible timings too. Uh, you know, so, yeah, they they touched the hot stove a few times, but there was a few times that they thought the stove was on low and it was really on full blast high, and they still touched it. So, you know, yeah. Well, the latest thing yeah, has to be the alliance tournament where they thought, let's underplay this. 
And then, you know, uh, that could have been done better. Here's, here's a YouTube thing, like nothing else. And then everyone else is like, they're going to announce the end of scarcity via a two minute YouTube video, guys. That's definitely what CCP has well, always done with their YouTube videos. I have and to, then they got mad and CCP's like, we're just announcing something fun. Calm down. I have to kind of laugh at Brisk here because he comes out on Reddit and he's like, oh, there might be a little something. And then uh, and I felt like that's to associate himself with something cool. And then it's, uh, you know, probably he heard from so, his people that they were like disappointed. And so to see him walk that back was actually quite comical. Anyway. Yeah, it, it's it's just a, a good for the game, period. Even if it's not your cup of tea, you should be happy that the AT is returning for, uh, according to the comments, all 12 players that play in the AT, <laughs> sure. You know, but at the end of the day, it's it's development in the game. The tools were in disrepair. They've been working on the tools. I'm sure, you know, yeah, look, Stargazer's nodding because he knows how bad the referee stuff had gotten there and all. So, you know, that is that is a good thing for the game, period. Just because you don't much care for the AT, I'm sorry, but uh, other stuff is coming. The community team's getting bigger. COVID's in the rearview mirror, and hopefully Vegas and FanFest and everything else can happen and uh, get us back to some sort of normalcy. And oh, by the way, scarcity has to go away sometime, maybe. Yeah. Now, last comment here from the chat is, uh, but for the love of God, don't just focus on PvP only. The game is more than that. I couldn't agree more with that. But we are talking about Alliance Tournament, which is the, uh, the top of the mountain as far as PvP. If you're going to perform well, you want to do that in front of everybody and get the huge cash prizes. Uh, but yeah, the game is definitely a lot more than that. I think when people say, oh, uh, EVE players want this, EVE players want that, EVE players complained about this, then they complain about the, and then they complain about the opposite. Those are different groups. The game's filled with different groups. So when, when CCP says, hey, here's the Alliance tournament back, there's a group of players like these guys that are pumped up. This is a big deal. And you have people coming back to the game that are pumped up. This is what they played for. Anyway, uh, do we have anything else that we need to cover? We're going to do some more stuff, but we could, we could do that a different day. Kenneth, you got anything else? If not, let's just go into last comments. If you guys have some yeah. last comments you want to make. Nah, I'm good. Chicken's all back in the coop. That was the important part. <laughs> Wife's out there now <laughs> putting the hardware cloth back on, so I'm good. Got some Mission Impossible chickens out there. Well, we are a lot of... Oh, sorry. <laughs> how you got cut you guys off? Yeah, no, I was just saying we have a lot of red hawks. So uh, until we can learn the ladies to stay in the woods and not run around the open field where the hawks can just feast on them, we got to kind of be, you know, somewhat careful with them. Nature. Go ahead, Suetonia. I was just going to say, like, I just want to thank CCP for bringing back the AT, like CCP Aurora and CCP Swift, and like all of the people at CCP have been like working hard to bring it back. Just thank you. Yeah, I'm going with that. Uh, even T Team also, Stargazer, I know you guys work your air butts off there. I'm being careful. You work your high knees off back there. So, again, I appreciate it so much. This is why I play this stupid game for more than half of my life. So, thank you guys. Over a year in the making, Aurora said yesterday. Um, looking forward to it. Were you involved in that, by the way, while they were in negotiations to bring it back, or was that something you were brought in at, at the end here? Um, I mean, I've been part of EVENT since 20... Well, since the Alliance Tournament 15, I think is probably the, the moment I got involved in just in general with the uh, the the event team, the actual refereeing element of what I do. Uh, I think the first one I actually did for that was the the Kaldari Cup at FanFest. Uh, what was that now, like four or five years ago? Yeah, I meant the... Uh, I think it was in uh, 2019, right? 2019, there you go. Yeah, I meant the Alliance Tournament. Did you know they were bringing it back? You did early, but how early did you know they were bringing it back? Uh, a while ago. Okay, that's safe. <laughs> this this isn't really leaks but like even t will talk about like guys we should push ccp for tournament support and if they don't then we can just run our own because like for those who don't know tournament scenes like the, a lot of repeat characters so you have to make sure you time it properly so 
Like we, I know even T plus the plethora of other tournament folks have been pushing for CCP to do this for a while. There's, there's always a lot of planning that comes involved in, in the tournaments. And for sure, it's always a case of like, we'll, we'll reach out to CCP, see if they're interested in doing doing something. You know, if it's a case of they're not interested in doing something, then we'll start planning something. But it's it's always a case of regardless of whether they're doing it or whether we're doing it, there's always planning that's going to be involved at some degree. And then, you know, when it's actually ready to be announced, it might be a case of then we've heard back from CCP or, you know, we, we plan to do it ourselves. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Suetonia, Casper, Stargazer. And you're one of two Stargazers that I know. Um, you are my general. brother. <laughs> yeah. Tiberius Stargazer is uh, my old partner in crime from six years ago. And uh, this is General Stargazer, also equally nice and great guy. Uh, and Rain, uh, thanks a lot for hanging out with us. All right. I think was fun. Yeah. Thanks very much, everyone, for watching today. We will uh, be back next week, and uh, I think we'll have another week of talking in station, so check that stuff out. I encourage you to go back and look at last week's show, some really good ones. Notably, we had Lady Scarlet on, talking about old times, talking about what it's like to be a corporate leader, uh, what it's like to be a diplomat, and she also addressed some of the stuff and cleaned up some information for uh, one of the FC groups that left NCDOT uh, recently, which is interesting. So it's the other side of the story there. Uh, you guys are great. It's always nice to talk to you. Um, super advanced players. I'm in awe of how much you know at the top of your hand, at the top of your heads. Uh, so I'm uh, always excited to listen to you guys. All right, everyone, take care. We will see you next time on Talking In Stations. <laughs>